today's message I want to preach to you, it's one of those messages when pastors come up here, they often say like, this message is just as much for me as it is for you, right? You hear that a lot, don't you? And, and to me, it's a little bit cliche when pastors say that because we don't often literally mean it's always for us. I mean, it's kind of like when you get a new product, right? You're like, this product literally changed my life when it's more like it figuratively changed my life. But really, this message tonight that I'm gonna share with you is really for me. Because I've been struggling with something a lot recently, and I've really been struggling with it, and I've been seeking after God, and I've been praying, and I've been asking God to give me clarity on this topic. And tonight, essentially, is just the clarity that I receive from the Lord on this topic. And I know that if I'm struggling with it, guess what? Someone else is struggling with it also. So the title of tonight's message is Don't Give the Devil a Seat at Your Table. Before we get too far into the message, I wanna tell you guys some funny stories. How many of you guys like funny stories? Everyone likes funny stories, right? Now, these stories aren't my own personal stories, but they are real stories from real people. And I wanna share them with you because I thought they're kind of funny. The first story is this. My seven-month-old, seven months, just remember that, was wearing a shirt and it had a rocket ship on it and it had a NASA logo on it. And I was shopping at Walmart when a lady came up to me and she said, he shouldn't be wearing that shirt. Clearly, he's not an astronaut. This woman, clearly, this seven month old is not an astronaut. <laughs> but she got offended because he was wearing a shirt that said NASA on it. Next story. At my wedding, not my personal wedding, but at this person's wedding, we marked the vegetarian items as vegetarian. And this made my one vegetarian friend at my wedding very offended because we were singling out vegetarian food as vegetarian and not as normal food. I asked the person, how the heck were people supposed to know if this was vegetarian or not? And he had no response. I mean, that seems kind of polite, right? Like you invite somebody to your wedding and you think enough of them that you know that they're vegetarian, that you're gonna give them a meal specifically for them and then you label it to be nice and then this person gets offended. Next story. We were choosing a mascot for a team building event at work. It was the first day of the event, of the event and we allowed the employees to vote for the mascot. It was sort of a team bonding experience. And this year, the team voted a wolf as a mascot. Now, I think wolves are pretty cool because obviously I like dogs. We have four of them. So they voted a wolf as a mascot, and it was almost unanimous. But one gentleman in his late 40s, early 50s, he threw a fit because wolves are bad guys, and they're predators, and they're killers, and he doesn't want to be a wolf. So he refused to participate in any of the team events because he didn't want to be on the team with bad guys. Now, can you imagine, this is a grown man throwing a fit because they have a mascot for a team event as a wolf. My final story for tonight. I was at the vet with my cat. Now, if you guys know me, you know I'm not really a cat fan, but I do really want a hairless cat. My wife is shaking her head right now because every time, I'm not a freak, and the hairless cats aren't freaks either. I even have a name, Fluffy, okay? So I keep bringing up this idea, baby, when we get this hairless cat, just reminding her and kind of like hoping one day she'll let me get a hairless cat. But anyways, back to the story. I was at the vet with my cat, and he sneezed. It was very offensive to the woman sitting next to me. So she leaned over and said, your cat is going to get my dog sick. Now, this is four stories. This website literally had hundreds of stories just like this, of people's events where people were getting offended. Now, the last time I preached, I preached on the, the message was titled, The Greatest Sermon Ever, and I didn't preach the greatest sermon ever, and Pastor Larry didn't preach the greatest sermon ever, even though he's much closer than me, but Jesus preached the greatest sermon ever, and I wanna continue on with this idea, these ideas from the greatest sermon ever. And today I wanna to talk to you guys about offense or being offended. Because I don't know about you, but I've been offended a lot recently. 
And I've been really trying to deal with this in my spirit and really trying to deal with this in a Christian way. And so I wanna talk to you guys about offense and how when we let offense in our lives, we are giving the devil a seat at our table. You see, offense can cause us to become a slave. Offense can put us in a prison. And each of these stories that I just read to you, they were all about offense, right? But the fact is, if you Google search the word offense, do you know what you're gonna find? One of the first things that populates up is, that, is the, the title this. This is the exact title. People will be offended over anything. People will be offended over anything. And in fact, social media even has a name for these people. So if you are a female and you're offended easily, do you guys know what the name is? You're a what? You're a Karen. If there's any Karens in here, I'm sorry. I didn't make these up, okay? Karen, I'm sorry if I offended you. <laughs> if you're a male and you're easily offended, you are a Chad. So we live in a climate where it feels like everyone is offended by something. And tonight I wanna talk to you guys about how we can be set free from offense. Amen. Let's pray real quick before we get into the word. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I worship you, Lord God. I pray that you would speak through me. Holy Spirit, I pray that it would be you that speaks into our hearts tonight, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your words would penetrate our hearts deeply, Lord, and we would leave here tonight and we would leave offense at the altar, Lord God. I pray that you would open up our ears and our hearts to receive this word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm gonna be picking up in Matthew chapter five, the greatest sermon ever, in verse 21, and it says this. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Now, this is the beginning of a series of what I call Jesus's theological upgrades. Jesus was, was taking some wisdom that was passed down and possibly diluted from the laws of Moses. And Jesus, with all of his wisdom and his understanding, was showing us what these laws really mean. He was digging a little bit deeper into these laws. And in grad school, my professors used to always tell me, I want you to dig a mile deep and not a mile wide. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Because in Jesus's time, in the time of legalism, they were digging a mile wide, but they weren't digging a mile deep. And Jesus wants to show them some very important things in these few verses. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it pretty amazing that the Bible and that Jesus can speak to us so profoundly in just a few sentences. Like he can literally address huge issues in just like a few sentences. And that's what Jesus is gonna do in these few sentences that we're gonna read tonight. And this is kind of the overarching theme, I think, of these verses, and it's this. Long before something happens in our lives, it happens in our minds and it happens in our hearts. Long before something happens in our lives, it happens in our minds and it happens in our hearts. So continuing on, it says, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say to you, if you're even angry at someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, there's a lot of that going around today, right? Like if you watch the news, this news channel is calling this news channel an idiot, an idiot. These people are calling these people an idiot. Like everyone's calling everybody idiots now. But Jesus says, if you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse somebody, you're in danger of the fires of hell. And that's kind of scary to think about because I've called somebody way worse names than a fool before, especially when I was a drunk. And I don't wanna go to hell. I don't know about you, but again, what started as a thought ended up as a word and it can actually create a living hell inside of us. Did you know that we can turn our lives into a living hell, that we can be in bondage by, by what we allow to have access to our minds and what we allow to have access to our hearts. You can turn something beautiful. Our minds and our hearts, they're beautiful, but we can turn them into garbage dumps. I think that's the idea that Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about something abstract or even theoretical. He's saying that anger in your heart, that bitterness in your heart, that offense in your heart 
If it's unresolved, it can cause problems in our relationships and it can cause us to be in a, be in a living hell. And if we continue down that path, of course, we will end up in an eternal hell. But I can't help but to think when you look at these passages as a whole that Jesus is not only talking about eternal hell, but he's also talking about what's happening inside of us. He's talking about a matter of our hearts. And the reality is there's, there's something to be examined about the progress, the progression that offense has in our lives. I mean, for real, we really live in a time of perpetual offense. As I mentioned before, it seems like people are offended about anything. And personally for me, before I put, say anything, before I put anything on social media, I don't know about you guys, but I'm always thinking like, okay, how can I word this so I'm not going to offend somebody? Like, and that's, I feel like that's the wrong mentality that, we, that we're having. And in fact, the, what kind of started me off on that was this, the last church I worked at, we had a senior, pa our senior pastor had his first grandchild and pastor, you know, he was so excited about having his first grandchild, right? And his first grandchild was getting ready to have a procedure that most boys have in the first couple weeks. And in fact, the Gentiles, they were very proud of this procedure and they tried to push this procedure on, or the Jews were very proud of this procedure and they tried to push it on the Gentiles. I hope you guys know what I'm talking about. And there, his grandson was getting ready to have this procedure and he went to the hospital with his, with his daughter and his grandbaby and he took a picture with his grandbaby before. And you know how it is when you take a picture and you think that like the picture's great, but then you look at the picture and your face is all like, like all whacked, like crazy. And he did that, he took a picture with his grandbaby, he left, he got home, he looked at his cell phone, looked at the picture and it's like, whoa. So he posted on Facebook jokingly saying, the, the moment before, dot, dot, dot. You know what happened? Like people got really offended, really offended. And I'm not just joking, like literally there was over a thousand comments on his picture talking about how he was a child abuser, how they couldn't believe that he would let his grandchild go through this procedure. And then they found out that he was a pastor. So then they went to our Facebook page, our church page, and they started just blasting the fa our Facebook page, talking about how offensive it is that our senior pastor would allow this abuse to happen to a child. Now, mind you, this isn't even his child. Like, it's not like he actually has a say so, it's his grandchild. And Angela and I, we have dogs. We have a Doberman Pinscher. And I don't know if you guys know, but Doberman Pinschers, their ears are pointy, but when you get them, they're floppy. So you have to crop their ear, and we cropped our Doberman's ears. And I posted a picture on Facebook afterwards with his ears cropped, and they were all taped up, and he looked all cute. Guess what? Someone got offended. Somebody got offended and said that I abused my dog. People are just so offendable. That's that's. The bottom line, what I'm trying to get to here, people are so offendable. And guess what? Sometimes, <laughs> that was me, it's like a reverb. <laughs> like remix. People are so offendable and sometimes Christians are the worst. Which is awkward to me because it's kind of ironic because the faith that we base our lives around is based on somebody who literally dropped every offense that we had and that we committed against him. But yet, as Christians, sometimes we are the worst ones. And I, I, I am to blame with this. And I need to be careful because often, especially lately, I found myself so offended over things that are happening. But here's the thing. Offense is the bait of Satan. Offense is the bait of Satan. Now, I didn't come up with that, that line. In fact, there's a John Bervere, if you've ever heard of him, he wrote a book called The Bait of Satan. And it goes into depth on this thought. But for real, offense is the bait of Satan. Satan wants us to be offended. And here's why Satan wants us to be offended. Because guess what? Offense, it steals our joy. Offense steals our joy. There's a reason sometimes why we're not happy and it's because we're easily offended. And that's a hard truth, but if you wanna make your life a little bit happier, try making it a little bit harder to be offended. I mean, that's a hard truth, but it's the truth. 
Now, I partially want to blame media for all this, to be honest with you, because it seems like media is, is the catalyst to all this offense. But we, as believers and as human beings, we need to be held accountable. Because media doesn't cause me to be offended, it's just gasoline on the fire, right? And Jesus teaches us here that when we have offense in our lives, and if we entertain it, guess what? It'll spiral out of control. It'll spiral out of control. How, do you, how many of you guys know that things can spiral out of control so fast that you didn't even know that it happened? Like, honestly, I can be at the store I can be like totally happy. I'm with my wife and we're getting ready to go eat some good food. And I'm like, da, 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 and I'm like super happy. And then all of a sudden somebody does one thing. And then I'm all of a sudden offended. And like, I'm the incredible hawk ready to smash something. Two seconds earlier, I was like the happiest person on earth because I was getting ready to eat a T-bone. And that's honestly what the enemy wants to do. The enemy's agenda in our lives is destruction. John 10, 10 says he came to kill, steal, and destroy. And the enemy's agenda is destruction and his strategy is division. Matthew 12, 25 says, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. Any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. And guess what? The enemy knows that. I mean, does it ever feel like to you that America is on like the brink of civil war? When I watch the news, it feels like we are about ready to collapse. But basically what Jesus is saying here is that if the enemy wants to destroy your house, the first thing he must do is divide your house. And that's not only happening in the world, it's obviously happening in the world. If you look at the world, especially if you look at the United States, there's division everywhere. But guess what? It's happening in the church also. I mean, and I didn't really notice it all that much until COVID. And COVID hit and all of a sudden it was masks or no masks. It was, should the church stay open? Should it shut? Should you get the vaccine or shouldn't you? And the division begins and we start fighting over things. And it doesn't only happen in the world. It doesn't only happen in the United States. It doesn't only happen in the church. It also happens inside of us. When our thoughts and our actions don't line up with the word of God, and we start holding on to these things that are offending us. Guess what? That's separating us from God. And the enemy's agenda is destruction, his strategy is division, and he's not going to be happy until he sees the whole world divided. But particularly, he's not going to be happy until he sees the church in a civil war. That's what he wants. So again, his agenda is destruction, his strategy is division, and at least in my life, his tactic is offense. It's offense. Satan's tactic is offense. He has an offensive strategy. If he walked up to me and he wasn't so subtle, I wouldn't fall for his schemes, right? However, the enemy is strategic, and Jesus, in the greatest sermon ever, talks and gives us the playbook as to how the enemy is going to attack us. Satan isn't going to come up to you and be like, hey, I want to destroy you. I mean, pastor talks about this. Satan doesn't have a tail, a pitchfork, and horns. He's clever. Instead, it usually smart starts in a very, very small way. It usually starts in a tiny little offense, a little thing that we let fester and we let grow. And in Matthew chapter five, Jesus shows us how to deal with offense and put the devil on defense. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, <laughs> Oftentimes, just a small word, it's just a small word that I just dwell on. And here's the thing. The closer something is to your heart, the greater opportunity it has. And what I mean by that is this. The closer something to your heart is, the greater opportunity you have to love it, but also the greater opportunity that you have to be offended when somebody says something about it. And it seems like the enemy knows exactly what's close to my heart, and that one word will be planted, and all of a sudden I'm offended. So I ask myself, like, I can understand how the world gets offended and how the world has division. They don't have Christ. But as a church, as believers, I have to ask myself, how can a church who's called to love the Lord with all their heart, mind, and soul get so lost in offense? I guess the answer is one tiny offense at a time. One tiny offense at a time. And Jesus, in his 
theological upgrades in Matthew chapter five helps us with this. And I can't again help but think he's talking about our hearts. Because if we get something in our hearts against somebody and we nurse it and we rehearse it long enough, it will literally eat us alive. And we will be in a prison of our own making one tiny offense at a time. Now, last time when I preached on the greatest sermon ever, I talked about how sometimes we wear masks and we smile like everything is great, but deep inside of us, something else is happening, right? So I wanna continue on here in Matthew chapter five, verse 23 and 24 says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and then you remember that your brother and sister has something against you, leave your gift in the altar, first go and reconcile with them, then come and offer your gift. You see, at church, we can come to church and we can raise our hands and we can praise and talk about mercy and grace, but if you knew what was happening on the inside, the offenses that we're holding. This verse is simple. It teaches us that we can be doing something godly, but on an inward level, we can be full of rage or anger or bitterness or offense. And I'm right there with you because when I look at the world around us and I watch the news, it makes me so angry. It makes me so upset. And the devil, his plan is to wear us down and tear us apart. I mean, God wants us united, but the devil wants us divided. And it's interesting because in Galatians chapter three, Paul says something very profound. And I never really picked this up until recently. I've been doing a, a Bible study on Galatians chapter three. And I, I just, I, I, I've picked this up the last time I was studying this. And it's really interesting. Paul says something very profound in Galatians three twenty eight. He says, therefore, we are no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for we are all one in Christ. Did you catch it? Like the special part of that? We usually skip to the, for we are all one in Christ and say amen, because that's, that's an amen moment, right? But think about what Paul is stating here. He is literally stating the great human divides. He's saying race, religion, status, and gender. Then he's saying we are, that's demolished, because we are all one in Christ, because Christ wants to unite us, no matter our race, no matter our religion, no matter our status, no matter our gender. God wants us all to be one under him. God doesn't want our nation to be divided. He doesn't want our world to be divided. And he certainly doesn't want the church to be divided. God wants the church to be one with him. And it's great because God can take two and he can make it into one. And in Genesis 2, it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And in Ephesians 5, it says the same thing. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's talking about a bride and a groom here. Do you know what the church is? Anyone? Right? According to 2 Corinthians and according to Revelations, the church is the bride of Christ. And you see, God wants us to be united with him because we are his bride. But the devil wants to separate us from God. We are called to be one body, one bride for Christ. But the enemy tries to take one and make it two. Whereas God takes two and makes it one. The enemy tries to tear us from God. The enemy tries to tear us from other believers. And most of all, the enemy tries to get believers to have this mentality of us versus them. It's an us versus them mentality that he's trying to get us to fall into. And again, Paul confronts this idea head on when he talks to Peter in Galatians. You see, Peter, a Jew by birth, now a Christian, is eating lunch with some of his Gentile buddies. But then some of his, his Jewish buddies show up. And all of a sudden now Peter doesn't want to eat with the Gentiles because he doesn't want to offend them because his, his Jewish buddies know that his Gentile buddies didn't have the procedure done. So he didn't want to offend his buddies. And Paul calls Peter out on this type of faith because this creates a, a, a mentality of division. This creates a mentality of, well, we don't eat with those people. We're not gonna eat with those people. When Christ said we are supposed to be united, and again, it happens one small offense at a time. Now, 
I may seem like a pretty laid back person and I am, but I can get offended so easily. And that's why I've been praying about this message. And that's why I've been asking God to really speak to me. Because have you ever noticed somebody, you can have a thousand people say something nice to you, but then the only thing that you remember is that one negative thing that somebody told you to offend you. Like in a day, I could have a thousand people say something great about me. Man, that message was great. Man, it's so amazing, this or that. And then one person says one negative thing. I forget everything those other people say and I focus in on that. And I think the way the world is, the way media is, the way education is, we've actually trained ourselves to find offense and then overreact to it even when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So Jesus goes on to tell us how bad it can get if we don't deal with offense and if we let it fester. In verse 25, he says, when you're on your, way to your, on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge and then over to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. Now, I think it's strange, right? Because two verses before this, it said, if your brother and sister has something against you, now he's calling, saying your adversary. And it makes me think that a person that we call our brother and sister in verse 23 can become, can become our adversary if we don't learn how to deal with the fence. Because it can happen. Now, I'm gonna get very personal with you. Very personal. One day you can call somebody your brother and sister and the next day, literally the next day, you can call them your adversary. Now, my family who are in this situation call themselves Christians. And they got offended at one another and now they don't even speak to each other. Literally, a mother, a father, a brother, and a sister related by blood, my family, we grew up in a close-knit family. Nothing would tear us apart. Now, all of them say, most of them saying that they're Christians have a fence stuck in their hearts and now my brother, my mother, and my sister, they live five minutes from each other, but they might as well live five miles. They don't talk to each other, all because of one offense. All because one person said one thing and another person said another thing, and all of a sudden, one day, literally, they were brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. The next day, they were adversaries, and they didn't want anything to do with each other. And that's what, that's what happens with the fence. And that's what the devil wants. He wants to split families apart. He wants to split believers apart. But Jesus puts it in good perspective and he gives us the key here to dealing with the fence. In verse 25, he says, settle matters quickly. Settle matters quickly. This is powerful but important. Then he goes on to say, do it while you're still on the way. Don't let things get out of control is what he's saying. Handle matters quickly. Do it while you're still with the person, while you can still stand being in the same room with them. Because with my family, they can't even stand being in the same room together anymore. It's festered too much. And it all started with one person saying, you fool, just like in this verse, you fool. It seems like such a small offense to call somebody a fool, right? It doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But when one person calls somebody a fool, guess what? The other person has to respond and say, no, you're a fool. Because that's just what you have to do, right? And now my entire family is divided. And it's sad because they don't want anything to do with each other over some tiny little offense. And the reason I'm telling you this is because in the heat of the moment, oftentimes we don't realize the fact that offense could literally rip our families apart, could literally rip the relationships that we value apart because the enemy's agenda is destruction, division, and he uses offense to do that. And here's the thing. The question isn't like if offense is going to come into our lives, because guess what? You're going to get offended. Somebody, some kind of offense is going to happen in your life. The question is, how are we going to deal with it? That will determine how strong our relationship with God is and how strong our relationship stays with other people. Now, 
How many of you guys remember the mission statement for the church? I say it every Sunday. Here at North Central Church, we love God and we love people. We love God and we love people. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's gonna be hard to love others if, you hold, if you're holding offense against them, if you are offended by them. If you wanna live up to the mission statement of this church to love God and to love people, you can't hold offense against somebody. Now, I'm not just talking about loving people that we are close to and not holding offense against people we are close to because I don't know about you, but lately, the things that have been offending me, it's not necessarily people I'm close to, it's like people that I might consider my enemy. Like when I watch the news and I see the things that are happening, I might consider these people my enemy. But further on in, in Matthew chapter five, he says, I say, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. If you love only those who love you, what reward is that? Even the corrupt tax collectors do that much. So if you're kind to only your friends, how are you different from everyone else? Even the pagans do that. So I say that we are to love God and we are to love everyone else as God did. God didn't hold a grudge against us. He didn't hold a fence against us. But sometimes we live our lives like this. Well, you don't know what they did. They did X, Y, and Z. Are you fill in the, you fill in the blank. I'm not going to be the first one to say I'm sorry because you don't know what they did to me. Or we say like, you won't believe what they said. Or we say, well, don't you see that they're tearing the moral fabric of our, of our country apart? I'm not going to pray for them. But that's not what Jesus says to do here. He says to love your enemy. Worship team, if you want to come up. If we want to be people who hold on to offense, we are going to find ourselves in a prison that we created. By being offended at somebody, by holding a grudge against somebody, it's not imprisoning somebody else, it's actually imprisoning us. Because offense is an event, but being offended is a decision. And it's a decision that you and I can choose to make or not make. Now, Louis Giglio put out a new book, and it's actually where I got the title of this message from. He put out a new book, it's called, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. And in his book, he's not actually talking about offense. He's talking, in the book he talks about having an even though I will faith. Even though this happens, I will still serve the Lord. And even though I will faith. But those nine words when I read that title spoke to me when it comes to offense. Those nine words can change your life because if you let offense come into your life, if you let offense creep into your mind, into your heart, guess what? You're giving the devil a seat at your table. So we have a choice. In his book, Louis Giglio says this, we often give the enemy access to our thoughts, our hearts, our emotions, to our responses, and to the way that we view situations. And when you think about that, that goes right along with what we do for offense. We allow, we give the enemy access to put these offenses into our lives, into our thoughts, into our hearts, into our emotions, into our responses, and into the way that we view situations. And I don't think that the devil deserves a seat at our table, not when the Lord is sitting there. He is our great shepherd. He's the one that prepares the way, not the devil. You guys could stand with me. I wanna thank God that he gave us a way to deal with offense. And these verses, he tells us to deal with them quickly. But wouldn't it be nice if we had an example of somebody that we could look up to, who had every right to be offended, to hold a grudge, but he didn't, instead he opened his arms. I mean, if we wanna be, and we wanna live a life like Christ, we need to learn to live a life of not being offended. And I don't mean that we are supposed to suppress offense, and I don't mean that we don't deal with it, but after we've dealt with it quickly, after we've talked to the person, maybe we see eye to eye, maybe we don't, then we drop it. 
just like Jesus did. When I confess my sins to Jesus, guess what? He didn't hold those offenses against me. And when you confess your sins to Jesus, he didn't hold those offenses against you. And he was faithful and just to forgive us of those things. And we need to be the same way. We need to, when somebody offends us, we need to be able to forgive them. Now, we can't control the offenses that are going to happen in our lives, but we can control how we're going to deal with them. Are we gonna let them build up until we explode? Or are we gonna deal with them quickly like Jesus said? We know which one the enemy wants us to do. He wants us to think about it. And he wants us to think about it some more. He wants that bitterness to drive deep into our hearts. And he wants us to never let it go. But Jesus and God wants us to drop it. And the fact is, he said, if you're at church, if you're in the altar, if you're giving a sacrifice and you realize that you have an offense in your heart or somebody's offended you or holds an offense against you, you know what, you need to leave and deal with that first. You see, we can't properly connect with God when we hold offense when we are offended with somebody and we hold that resentment in our hearts. And I understand that reconciliation isn't always possible. It's not always an option, but release is always available. And release is always available because it starts inside of us. I'm sure you've heard this quote. It says, forgiveness was setting a prisoner free and realizing that prisoner was me. Forgiveness was setting a prisoner free and realizing that prisoner was free. And I believe that God wants to release us from being offended tonight. Now, I'm not saying that we have to agree with everybody, but I am saying that we don't need to be offended by what somebody else says or does or doesn't say or doesn't do. And my prayer tonight is that if you're holding on to offense in your life, if your pride is getting in the way of you saying you're sorry, if you're festering over something that somebody else did or said or didn't do or didn't say, that you'll come to the altar tonight and give it to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we worship you, Lord God. I pray that you would take these burdens from our lives, Lord Jesus, that you would take this offense from our lives, Lord God, that we would offer forgiveness as you offered forgiveness, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts, Lord God, to pour out your love on those who are close to us and those we may consider our enemies, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would stir in our hearts, Lord God, and we would give these burdens to you, Lord Jesus, and that you would open up paths for us to be your vessels, your hands and your feet in this world. I pray these things in Christ Jesus' mighty and holy name, amen. The altars are open. I just ask you to just find some time and spend it with the Lord. Amen. Who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could come for me? Love me like you do.